By the 70s, the sounds of surf sat in popular culture as old, played out, and cliched. The genre started breaking big back around 1961, and some will credit it as coming into existence in that time. Most of its style originated with experimentation in instrumental rock in the 50s. Fast tempo for four guitar, with wet reverb, a reliance on vibrato, and tremolo picking. <laughs> The rest of a surf band likely features an electric bass guitar, a drum kit often with extended percussion, occasional brass and woodwind, and frequent incorporation of instruments invented in Pacific Island nations like ukuleles. Surf rock specifically gets attributed to California, where a handful of early acts mixed European and Near East stylings, incorporating those sounds with the experimental instrumental rock scene. And true to the instrumental rock tradition it split from, early surf was slow to innovate beyond a few early trailblazers, in part due to the prevalence of covers and recompositions. At the time, a band could break big just from getting a good cover with little or no original material and little incentive to trailblaze the new material themselves. This also complemented the aggressively casual tone of the genre as a fledgling counterculture celebrating freedom in the face of repressive 50s America, much like the hot rod rock and roll aesthetic developing partly from it, partly alongside what these musicians in the 50s accomplished on their electric guitars was new ground for their medium, but evoked some sounds already invented in the Pacific roughly a century prior. The Hawaiian steel guitar first became popular in pop culture in the mainland US about 50 years earlier, before surf as we know it was born. In the 1910s, traditional Hawaiian music was one of the best-selling genres in the U.S. In 1918, the Washington Herald stated, So great is the popularity of Hawaiian music in this country that The Bird of Paradise, a 1932 musical with a score mostly adapted from Hawaiian music, will go on record as having created the greatest musical fad this country has ever known. By the 1920s, the Hawaiian steel guitar was taught in schools alongside European-invented instruments, and the steel guitar itself was becoming embedded in American original genres like blues and country, and grew from the hot new thing to just another leading genre to another bread and butter genre as American as apple pie. The pop music of the 40s and 50s recognized this and sometimes included steel guitar, along with backup vocal melodies generally meant to invoke the nostalgia of the 1920s Hawaiian music boom. As far as I know, there's no direct quote from a 50s surf band crediting Hawaiian music, but it's evident in at least some of the 50s and 60s surf acts that they took inspiration from Old Hawaiian. Melodic lines in 60s surf often resembled lines in 10s and 20s Hawaiian records. Electric guitars pumped out with reverb and vibrato traced similar fundamental guitar lines and sounds, but with a newfound leverage from technology. These musicians had grown up in a pop culture as saturated with Hawaiian music as the 2010s were with Marvel movies and controversial reboots, and it's likely that left an impression on them when they grew up to write their own work. Mm -hmm. 
This also reflected in a preference to Hawaiian influence, but little inspiration from Calypso in most early surf. Despite both Hawaiian and Calypso being incredibly popular and common in the US throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. First Hawaiian laying the hunger for a island theme ocean music craze, and then Calypso becoming popular in the US to build off of that. The status of both of these genres as ocean music. The sense that early surf acts not only taking inspiration from Hawaiian as a sound, but probably specifically from individual musicians as they tapped into the Hawaiian sound while generally avoiding the calypso. It's certainly technically possible these musicians coincidentally developed a similar sound. Inspiration is likely, but not irrefutable. Regardless, the subversion and turbulence achieved by surf rock musicians left a permanent impact as it became harder and bolder in the following decades, and its stings and progressions, its breakdowns and percussive performances, found their way to influencing rock in general. Musicians of the 70s, even the most prog, sometimes taking cracks at surfer drawing direct inspiration from it throughout their catalogs, incorporating it into their own new cycles of reinvention of music. Those musicians who created surf in the late 50s were soon followed by the musicians they inspired, and new acts came out with their own takes on the sound that could be covered by the acts they inspired, pumping the genre with a new life and a shot of adrenaline. With an influx in acts, the early 60s saw surf divorce into two main schools. The original instrumental, which could include vocals, but always focused on its reverby, subversive, and turbulent composition. versus vocal surf, the creation of which is usually credited to the Beach Boys, characterized by a doo-wop and 50s pop rock-esque vocal melody and a focus on catchiness and simple melodic hook, often with a smoother, simpler instrumental sound and more polished production. Pop culture, especially in retrospect today, calls both of these surf. Most people seem to more strongly associate the Beach Boys flavor of pop rock with the surf label. To many people today, that's just what surf is, and it's common to hear that the Beach Boys somehow invented the genre that they took influence from. Musically, vocal surf did and seek to innovate, rather reinterpreting instrumental surf into a melodic and poppy context. It's still easy to find debate on if vocal surf is real surf. Personally, I think that conversation closed 50 years ago. Vocal surf made a subversive counterculture into the mainstream culture, made a version which wasn't subversive, but that was the inevitable consequence of a genre becoming popular. It didn't unexist instrumental surf. Instrumental surf would continue on, and those artists and records still existed before and after. And while vocal surf eclipsed the original in popularity, instrumental surf would continue continue to innovate on itself, spitting out classic riffs, guitar lines, and rhythms, getting faster, bolder, perfecting itself to what later bands seem to love to pull from. Surf's astronomical rise in the early 60s met a harsh drop-off in the mid-60s, with the British invasion bringing similar experimentation and innovation as instrumental surf and instrumental rock did, but with much greater variety and a total divorce from the weighty past surf, blues, and folk rock contended with. The British invasion also brought with it a new standard to write original music and a death of cover culture, sending shockwaves into the habits of musicians that already existed and forcing many bands to adapt. It was, it was rough for us because we really didn't have, uh, we didn't write a lot, you know, hardly any in the beginning, and because uh, it wasn't common, it wasn't common for artists to write their own material, you know, then the Beatles came around here, all of a sudden there's a group that's writing all their own stuff, so, well, we better try to do something with that, you know, and then we tried and, and uh, didn't do very well at it. And then all of a sudden we had this uh, hit in Japan. Into the late 60s, the Beach Boys themselves were moving away from surf influence and to the mainstream, surf had died. But just like 20-ish years prior, all the music that had been written didn't just disappear, and the torch would be carried in niche scenes for the next decade. 
surf had risen with surf culture, and after mainstream surf died, it returned to the subculture that first helped it rise. Surfing itself has existed for thousands of years, invented in Polynesia and carried over Pacific Island cultures, Hawaii included, though while Hawaiian music boomed into America pop culture in the 1910s and 20s, surfing would mostly lag behind, existing in very small communities until the 50s and 60s, when surf rock and skateboarding, which was inspired by surfing, also caught on. Original Hawaiian surf culture took focus in all aspects of Hawaiian life for over 1,500 years, and without getting into too much, it was incredibly important to their society and religion. And as Hawaii was colonized, those aspects originally made it unsavory. The practice would be watered down to sport before being exported to the rest of the world. That taboo around it, aspects seen as scandalous, might be why surf culture appealed so strongly to 50s and 60s counterculture youth, and the same age bracket of people who took surf culture in the 50s would eventually develop hippie culture over the next decade. Since its inception, surf rock aimed to capture the feeling and aesthetic of the ocean, and it immediately appealed to the surfing culture it was named after. As surf culture died out in the mainstream, it persisted strongly in smaller communities, especially in California. Out-of-towners visiting the beach were usually pretty well-off, while the locals tended to be poor working class and alienated from those well-off people who seasonally flooded their communities. Consequently, they socialized with themselves and alienated tourists and out-of-towners. There's only a finite amount of places along the coast with good spots to surf. The geography of a shore and coast concentrates in desirable surf locations, spaced out by a lot of unsuitable spaces, and the locals wanted to keep the best places for themselves, and keep the endless streams of tourists out. While some surfers were just cold and distant to out-of-towners, others became more and more hostile, and in the 60s, surf punk became a term to describe surf locals who could be violent to outsiders who encroached on their space, and who used intimidation to discourage encroachment in the first place. Many surfers weren't surf punks, and while some surf punks could be territorial to other locals, many were just aggressive to outsiders, enforcing their principal moral code of locals only, keeping the local beach only to locals. It might not be immediately clear why I'm bringing this next part up, but it's a huge and unavoidable part of the story we need to cover for things in the next decades to make sense. It can be difficult to boil this down in a quick history like this, so a lot of people just don't, but I think that does a disservice to the actual history that happened. As certain surf clubs developed into increasingly violent and territorial gangs, some even went past surf punks to be surf nazis. It's important to point out that originally, the nasty part of surf nasty had nothing to do with ideology or politics. It was just meant to describe their thuggish, violent, exclusionist authoritarianism, a sort of nasty attitude, not actual belief. Over time, certain groups took on the label and called themselves surf nasties, and again, some of these groups called themselves nasties in an edgelord way, just to stir up what they perceived to be oversensitivity from tourists and normies. For those people, an actual ideology wasn't necessarily attached, while others really were just proud and all of this just to establish something apparent once you get into the music we'll cover later, with varying levels of sarcasm, irony, and commentary around the label in 60s and 70s surf culture, you really need to rely on specific context and your own critical judgment. The iconography is so common that it can't be ignored, and might be confusing if you don't have this context. So it's best to know the wide gradient of sincerity the word was used with, so you can judge for yourself if a particular work or artist was a misunderstood outcast using that imagery to scare people away, an edgelord using it the way edgelords do, or the unironic actual thing. Out, Kraut. Sand. And oh no! You couldn't handle the power! I'm usually not a fan of contributing the start of a genre to any one band. Anyone who frequents music scenes knows that for every huge mainstream band that brings a sound to a wide audience, there's 30 or 40 deep cut acts and 500 local bands who are totally forgotten and might have never released a single record. It's impossible to know what small ways forgotten acts might have contributed to the development of a sound. The Ramones are often credited as the first punk band, and their music contained influences from vocal surf acts that the members grew up listening to. So looking at early surf punk acts, it's hard to draw a line between acts actually taking influence from the Ramones, who took influence from their scene far prior, versus acts developing on surf itself, with little or no involvement from punk music, who just happened into a similar sound. Surf punks were older than surf punk and older than punk as a genre, and looking at the cultural traits of surf punks, it's easy to see why they took to punk, and why punks took to their instrumental surf. But I think there's a real danger of underselling the contributions small instrumental surf acts might have made in their scenes to getting surf punk to surf punk as a genre. As far as I'm concerned, the Beach Boys never did surf music justice for us. Well, 
surf punks were a SoCal instrumental surf act, who formed in 76, first released in 77, and ran until 88. Surf punks took their name from their subculture, proud Malibu locals raging against tourists from the valley, almost all their songs either highlighting the highs they found in surf, or their struggle against encroaching outsiders, embodying the culture of locals only. Instrumentally, surf punks represented the surf scene through the late 60s and 70s excellently. Not much progressed in the genre of instrumental surf in those decades, but they played that familiar pretty expertly and just slightly more aggressively and harshly than some older acts. With a solid understanding of their own genre down, they didn't focus on reinvention, possibly except for a bass styling which, while not anything new, was played so aggressively, quickly, and pluckily, it prematurely struck an approach taken by many surf punk bands in the following decade, somewhat better than some of those following acts did. They hit on a standard in their interpretation of a classic surf line that stacks up against the decades following it in its conviction, if not its intention. Surf punks were set aside by their lyrics and attitude. True to their premise, they were defined by sarcasm, a snideness and parody like fake bubbly, fake cheery facade, with tongue-in-cheek vocal clips, calling back to what was occasionally seen in old surf rock and amplifying it to 100. Predating the instrumental strides leading to true surf punk, they managed to capture an attitude which, apart from the bass, was an incredibly harsh or aggressive, but which was just ticked off enough. It hit on something not quite like anything before. Meanwhile, in Australia, surf had clung on in its subculture through the 60s and 70s, much like it had in Cali. In the mid-70s, Australian garage rock bands began drawing on influence from surf as well as early punk, and as residents of similar social and economic situations, began exploring similar themes. Radio Birdman was probably the first act of their type to build attention. Dark lyrics detailing depression and struggle, metaphorical scenes of dystopia, occasionally juxtaposed by lighter, poppier pops. Musically, I'd say surf influence was obvious, but seldom fully developed. The band both paying service to a pretty standard surf sound, while also trying to find ways to either enrich it, or use it to enrich the newer, harder, more hard rock-esque sounds they were developing, landing themselves in a sonic gray area that constantly feels on the verge of breaking into surf punk, but never quite charting its new exploration in that specific way, leaving the band feeling much more in line with dark wave than what's usually expected from surf. Rarely mixing the darkness with any snideness, the mood tended to be a darker panic or sometimes apathetic. That's why we, we like to play it, for our own enjoyment. High energy and aggression are two different things too. Uh, to say that music's aggressive because it's high energy isn't necessarily so. I and mean, some of our songs are, but a lot of them aren't. And uh, yeah, I think it's quite a difference, and often the audiences don't understand the difference between aggression and high energy. Aggression is a, a deliberate attempt to make somebody else think or do what you want them to do. I think, personally, it's an invasive sort of thing, aggression. The camera. But to us, it's more an assertiveness of what we're trying to do, and that might seem aggressive to people. But you know, I don't care if it does seem aggressive particularly, but since you've raised the issue, it's more an assertiveness than an aggression. Mm -hmm. An attempt to state what we're stating forcefully if necessary, but it's not an attempt to force other people to adopt it. And their integration of surf influence into this heavier themed, heavier composed rock left an impact on the dark wave acts that would form shortly after their run. More bands forming in the mid to late 70s would follow this trajectory, taking a little from surf into their core, just mostly focusing on finding their own new ways to develop that darkness into a more melancholy rock. Though this becomes its own rabbit hole, so it'll be left alone for now. Around the same time, the polar opposite bands started forming mostly in the States and UK, taking some surf influence along with the doo wop and other old types of rock, as well as early prog, and channeling them together for a more poppy, comedic, and cheesy end, intentional or not. Over the last three years of the 70s, a few more records came out which would gain cult followings, much like similar punk compilation albums would in the 80s and 90s. Most notably is probably 1979 compilation Beach Boulevard from Posh Boy Records, later publishers of several Agent Orange releases. Beach Boulevard featured three up-and-coming Cali acts. The crowd and Rick Alrick drew from instrumental surf as well as other influences, 
while the simple tones specifically distinctly channeled a marriage of instrumental and vocal surf. This was some of the only material ever released by these musicians, but word of mouth and especially subsequent re-releases of the greater punk crowd made this release modestly important to the spread of these sounds. These works also notable for being an introduction to several other facets of surf culture, including surf nineties. The Simple Tones openly identifying as such on a demo left off the original release, but later included in other compilations. From the tone of the song, it's the idea of surf Nazi in that traditional surf culture sense, but it's hard to be sure how shit posty they're being with the identity. I'll let you listen to the full thing if you want in your own time, and decide for yourself. Likewise, the song on the final thing also mentions Nazis, and tells the story of cops raiding a Nazi punk gang meeting. And similar issues persist. Again, I want to mention this since it's important to the history, and I'm trying to impartially present this face value. Rick L. Rick was also in negative trend, which. Had similar issues. The sound was arguably built on by Forgotten Rebels, formed in 78 and introduced on their debut in 80, with In Love with the System. Forgotten Rebels built on that sound tread by the previous acts of the scene, measured incorporation of melodic surf, melody, and guitar, but this time with less influence from instrumental surf and more dependent on 50s mainstream rock and roll to fill the gaps in their influence, making an album that was just as much a precursor to surf punk as it was a precursor to bar rock and bar rock influenced punk that would become popular to mix with hardcore over a decade later. Forgotten Rebels also sees a sort of climax in the edginess of the scene. The lead song, Bomb the Boats and Feed the Fish, takes a view of a fringe racist American thrilled to bomb refugees as they flee war in boats based on a true story. Looking at the nonsensical language and messages and general tone flooding the album, I think it's very likely satirical. But live music's a little different than a book or a movie or a statement. The satire Forgotten Rebels write was always from the perspective of the people they were mocking, so it was always possible to be misconstrued as an unironic person. Persona, reflecting the long-standing issue with Nazi surf punk edgelord theatrics. A little later down the line, the vocalist insisted his work was satirical, but the requirement of such a statement, and the type of people who were being attracted to the shows by these errors in communication, was beginning to clash with the more general punk culture that surf punk was growing into. Regardless, if you can reconcile how some of these songs can come off, the hardness they bring to ultimately simple poppy hooks is incredibly pop punk, but from 1980, and totally untouched by some of of the flaws the pop punk movement later brought, making this a very fun listen compositionally. It's time that we be nice to each other, and if somebody's acting out of line, he gets his ass kicked. Racism is stupid. People should listen to our music for what it is. I was making fun of rednecks and bomb the boats. More than anything, I was just making fun of that. But I guess it came across the wrong way. His bands were experimenting with surfy sounds in punky context, probably the first to break real ground with it and make waves were Dead Kennedys on 1980's Fresh Fruit for Rotten Vegetables. <laughs> I've already talked about the landmark debut and sophomore albums and the beautifully creative things they did with their surf influence, and if you want to hear 10 minutes of that, I'll link it in the top comment. But to make it as short as I can, Dead Kennedys broke onto the scene by incorporating classic instrumental surf with an unhinged manic aggression, which was unique even among punk, and their loyalty to and respect to surf, especially in East Bay Race guitar, both gave them perfect fuel for their highly sarcastic, satirical attitude and provided the perfect material for the skilled musicians of the band to strive to master and reinvent the complicated and historical sound with a fresh and harsher than ever spin. DK's explosion onto the scene also signaled the defining of firmer rules for what punks as their own scene would and would not tolerate. And in the following years, with just a few subgenres as exceptions, punks started weeding out the free-for-all flavor of edginess that allowed for surf Nazis. Plenty of people who listened to those acts didn't care about those elements, and I'm sure not every act that rolled with surf Nazi iconography were actual Nazis. But at the end of the day, punks began recognizing that boundless edginess like that only gave Nazis a 
shelter to hide in and plead ignorance from. It was too easy for actual Nazis to pretend to be edgelords, get into shows, and start beating up kids in the pit. It was okay to end the fun that some people got from edgy jokes if it meant keeping the more vulnerable members of their scenes and their shows safe from the violence that inevitably was wrought by liars pretending to be edgelords. Any excuse that anyone gives you for wearing them, that it looks great, that it, that it just looks nice and all that, that's a pile of crap to me. I yeah. mean, there's symbols and it, young people today have a lot of energy and they've got brains too and uh, they should look at symbols before they attach them to their bodies and uh, I don't buy any of the crap about swastikas being shock value mm -hmm. um, if they're wearing them just to make people mad that's stupid half the people that are wearing them that I've talked to don't even know what fascism is um, they just wear it because they look cool I do that song take off your swastikas and there'll be like sometimes there's like ten young people in the front with swastikas on giving me the Sieg Heil um, and then they all sneak up backstage when their friends aren't looking and say, I really like that song with Don't Tell My Friends. For a lot of punk, the 80s were the start of punk growing up and becoming a unified force. And consequently, with the identity of punk being defined, it was the beginning of the end of free-for-all edginess. And surf punk itself was beginning to transform into punkier ideas. While many were developing at the same time and coming from the same scene, the bands which would follow this turning point would begin reiterating on each other and pulling inspiration from each other, as well as the predating acts. And going forward, surf punk would come to be seen as a subsection of punk, taking just as much from punk culture, not so much what surf punk had been throughout the past. Because of this, the bands forming at this time are what are now usually seen in retrospect as the first surf punk acts. The first acts which, at least in retrospect, are seen as punk in ideology as well as punk in sound.